Are we okay? Is this sound going to work for everybody? You can hear me okay in the back? Okay, cool. I have lived in Moldova now for 15 years. Um, the first 11 years, uh, we did not have a car. Just decided to use public transportation and, uh, you know, if you want to take a walk in God's creation, the best place to do that is to get on a trolley bus. <laughs> just be right there, you know, just God's good creation all around, up close and personal. So I did that for 11 years. And uh, then we had the opportunity to buy a car. And, um, you know, during the 11 years, I never really paid attention to the street signs. They're different from the ones we have in my home country. So, but I never paid attention. But then we got the car, and unfortunately, I continued to not pay attention <laughs> until the ticket started showing up in the mail. And I'm reading these things, and I can't figure out what, where I went wrong. Or, and so I figured maybe now would be a good time to start learning what are the meaning of all these different signs, right? Signs are everywhere. We live by signs, don't we? We would not know how to get around the city without there being signs of every kind, especially road signs when you're driving. What, what is the purpose of these signs? They, they, they are information that give us guidelines about what we can and cannot do, right? They, they warn us sometimes, no, you can't do that. Or they, they tell us how far we can do something. So signs serve a very important purpose on our journey in the car. And if the better we know them, and the more time we spend obeying them, we will have a better driving experience on the road. But if we do not know them like I did, and we do not obey them like I sometimes don't do, then there's trouble, right? There's things that come in the mail, and it costs you something. Um, so signs are very important. And today we want to talk about signs, different kinds of signs, prophetic signs. Um, these are signs that Jesus gave to his disciples when they came and asked him some questions about the future. He wanted to know as they were walking through the journey of life, on the road of life, what were the signs? I need to know what the signs are, so I know how to go, and in, in what direction. And, and Jesus says, okay, I'll give you some signs. Um, I'll, I'll, I will speak into the future. That's what prophecy is, most of the time. It's speaking something yet to come, so that we can know, mark the way. All right, so as you remember, we've been in the Gospel of the Good News of Matthew, and last week and the next few weeks, talking about uh, the, the uh, signs that, God, that Jesus gave regarding uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and then also his second coming and the end of time, which of course is of great interest to us. So we're going to take a look at, at close, more closely at the signs, right? But we're going to go back just from verse 1 to refresh our memory where we were last week. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. He said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Okay. Now, his disciples are asking two questions. What are the two questions they're asking? First one is, when will these things 
about her. What things? Well, the things he was talking about, which was this temple that you see is going to be torn down. It's going to be destroyed. And a few verses before that, he said that about Jerusalem. It's going to be made desolate. So that's the first question. When will these things happen? Second question they ask is, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So this, we know, is about Jesus' second coming and uh, how history is going to wrap itself up. Okay, so we, we need to look at it's chapter 24 of Matthew is in two parts. Part one answers the first question about the temple and Jerusalem. The second part is about his second coming and the end of the age. And today we will look specifically at the first one. But there's a number of signs in this instruction he gives that are also applying to us, and that's what I want us to pick up on today. Now, Jesus is being very caring about his disciples, and he cares about us, because he tells us what's going to happen in the future, so that we can know and not be taken by surprise. Jesus wants his disciples, and he wants us to be prepared for the events that are going to take place, and in order that they know how to live in these uncertain times. Because Jesus does not want his disciples, and he does not want us to be misled off the journey, right? Go off in some road. He wants us to stay on course. He does not want us to be afraid. There's many things in, in the world today to make us nervous and afraid. Yes? He does not want us to be afraid. He does not want us to be confused. He wants us to know what to expect. Uh, and, he, and, and also, in, in the way that they live, not to live in fear and cowering, but he wants us to live in faith and hope, anticipation. That Jesus is coming back. Amen. We're looking forward to that. And he wants them to, to have anticipation and joy in the midst of the journey, looking at the signs as we go on the way. So, Jesus prepares his disciples by telling them what is going to happen in the future, both in the near future and in the distant future. All right? Are you with me so far? I just want to put up a quote that I like, and I hope you'll like it too, about prophecy and the purpose of prophecy. Prophecy is not intended to give us a detailed picture of the future, but it is intended to lift up our hearts in expectancy so that we will make ourselves ready for what is to come. It's, it's to put hope uh, in our hearts. And we may not know exactly how it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. And we set our hope on that, on the assurance of that. And it, so that prophecy is to encourage us and make ourselves ready. Now, we have to ask that what were the prophecies that Jesus gave about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? So let's read uh, the, the end, and we're going to read the beginning and then the end, because it says here at the end, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What things? Well, all the things leading up to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that everything he covers from verse 4 through 35, the first half of the chapter. So, in this generation, these things are going to take place. That's in the near. That's like someone saying, this prophecy I give to you, David, is going to happen in your lifetime. 
So it's going to happen in a certain number of years. You don't know when. You don't know how. You just know. That's, that's a pretty good I like the prophecy like that. At least it gives me some idea that I have some chance to see this thing come to pass in my lifetime, okay? And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words that I'm speaking to you right now about this, they're not going anywhere. These things are going to happen, okay? What things are going to happen? Well, let's read. Let's start in verses 4 through 8. So, in answering the disciples' questions, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, and saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. That is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. <clears throat> that ain't okay. All right, so here is the first set of things. All right, people coming to say they're the Christ and they're not. Um, we've got wars and rumors of wars. And we have uh, uh, famines and earthquakes and things like this. Okay, so these are some things that are, are going to start to happen. So, in the time after Jesus ascended into heaven, and for the next 30 to 40 years, there were a number of people who came into Jerusalem. There was one guy, I, I don't have his name written down, but he came into, into Jerusalem with 30,000 other people saying that he was the Messiah. There's a lot of people that were misled because he was not the Messiah. Jesus said, I don't want you, my disciples, my followers, to get taken off like that. I want you to understand, I am the Messiah, I'm coming back, but it's not going to be in that way. So he warned them against these false people who were going to look really good. And one of the things that they were going to offer the people was deliverance from the Roman Empire, which is the thing that they wanted more than anything else. Um, but Jesus said, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. Okay? So do not be misled. That was principle number one. Number two, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, nations rising up against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, famines and earthquakes, okay? So, Jesus is saying that in the coming decades, during the course of your life, you're going to see constant political uprisings and violence. There are going to be upheavals and natural disasters happening all over the place. And the natural response to these things is going to be what? Fear. He said, if you've been in an earthquake, you understand what fear is, right? Or a natural disaster that's bearing down on your house creates some serious fear. Um, and and, and or uprisings where suddenly everything is thrown up in the air all around you. You have no idea what's going to be the outcome. Jesus said, these things are going to happen. So don't be upset. Don't get, uh, be afraid of these things. They're going to happen. Don't worry about it. I have these things in control and, uh, and, they're, and they're not going to take you off from the path I have you on. Okay? And he says this, none of these things that we just talked about are the sign of the end. These are just birth pangs. These are like uh, you know, of course, he uses an analogy of a woman who is pregnant and is going through the process of giving birth. She goes through birth pangs, and they become more and more intense uh, again and again, 
But none of those things are the end. The end is when the, the child is given birth to, right? And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. What's the good thing that comes out at the end of all this? Jesus! He comes back and we see him face to face. That's a good thing. I'm looking forward to that. So there's a lot of pain and a lot of upheaval and upset that is going to happen. But I already know that. And so do you. Because Jesus told us this. So that we would not be living uh, to be misled or living in fear. We do not have to live that way. Okay? Um, now, after describing what happened was happening in the general world of uh, political stuff and, and natural disasters, Jesus turns to them and says, okay, you got that part, now things are gonna get real personal. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen to you. Verses nine through 14. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and ye will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness increase, is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. The good news of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So, the question is, did this stuff happen to the disciples? Yes. Were they turned over to tribulation? Oh yeah. Did they get killed? Every one of them, except John, lived out his natural life. So they all have suffered uh, martyr's death for the sake of following Jesus. But what Jesus also says here, and we need to make this connection, that is, he wants to prepare them for this political persecution and severe suffering that they're going to experience. But that that's going to be the very thing that's going to open the door to worldwide evangelism and the explosion of the gospel going out to the nations. Jesus knew that these fishermen and tax collectors and ordinary people would be God's instruments to <coughs> proclaim the good news of Jesus before kings, before leaders, and before thousands of people. They were going to witness thousands upon thousands of people coming into the kingdom as they proclaimed the good news about Jesus in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of persecution was the time when the gospel, the good news of Jesus, exploded out into the world around them. What is God's strategy for worldwide evangelism? <coughs> Persecution. Intense suffering. And even death. <coughs> Jesus himself went through this. It's not asking us to do anything that he did not do himself. He was betrayed. He was arrested. <coughs> he was beaten. And he was killed on a cross. What was the result of that? The salvation of the world. And we who choose to become followers of Jesus need to be ready to experience the same thing 
as Jesus. The disciples did. They experienced everything that Jesus experienced, and even to death for being a follower of Jesus. This is one of the signs, friends, that we're on the right path heading home. Here's something else that happens when there's intense persecution and suffering. Guess what? Verse 10 says, and many will fall away and will betray one another and hate each other. This too is going to happen at the same time. People, we can all, you know, gather together when things are good. But when the going gets tough, what's going to happen? There are going to be people falling away. Jesus warns us of this. All you have to do is read the letter that was written to the Hebrews. Anybody spend any time in the book of Hebrews? What's that letter about? It's about Jewish Christians that are thinking about leaving. Why? Intense persecution. Intense persecution. But the letter is warning them, stay on the course. Endure to the end. Do not give up in your suffering. So, persecution and intense suffering. Another thing will happen is many false prophets will arise and mislead any. This is all about the events of us going towards home. Our people who are trying to mislead us and speaking falsehoods, attractive things that will make us want to go off the path. Jesus is warning us of these things. How many millions of people are, are in groups that have totally denied who Jesus is? By the millions in the earth today. So we see this in, uh, all around here, and they were certainly experiencing this then. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So it's about endurance, about staying the course. So when we see persecution and intense suffering, it, there's two uh, reactions, two responses to it. You have unfaithful people who are really fake in their following Jesus and they fall away, they disappear. But then there's faithful and loyal followers of Jesus who get stronger, they press in to uh, the Lord and in with each other, and together growing stronger and enduring to the end. And the outcome of this is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world and to all the nations. Notice this. Because earlier in Matthew, Jesus sent his disciples out, but he only sent them to the lost sheep of Israel. Right? Remember that? Back in chapter 10. But now he's saying, no, I'm sending you out to the whole world. And that has always been God's plan. To be a blessing to the nations. To reach every person on the planet with the good news. This is and so he's releasing them to the mission to the whole earth. Um, so, uh, there's, there are a number of things that we need to take away from this ourselves. First of all, Jesus is telling us what's going to happen. Now, he's talking to his disciples. It's about an event in their lifetime, which happened. Do you know that? This is in the mid-30s. When was the temple destroyed in Jerusalem? In 70 AD. That's 35 years. A generation is about 35 to 40 years. It depends on the time period you're looking at by the definition of these. 
that generation would have seen the destruction of Jerusalem and the, uh, and the temple. But the same types of things, we can see the parallels, okay? So it's not, we're not worrying about the temple or Jerusalem anymore, but the same signs and the same things are, are things that we see today. Um, and, and so we know that those things will continue. They themselves are not the signs. Understand, wars and rumors of wars, let's take that for an example. How many of you think when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a war. It's just cataclysmic. Right? I, I've always thought this. But you know, he says a little bit, I'm stealing. Sorry, I'm going to steal something from next week. <laughs> but he says the coming of Jesus is like the days of Noah. Well now, what was happening on the days of Noah? Was there a world war going on? People were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. They were just yeah, they were just hanging out, doing what they did every day. They were not expecting or anticipating anything. Everything was as it was before, and they thought it was always going to be. It wasn't. It started to rain. It started to rain on the, on the wedding party and the reception hall that they had rented and six months in advance and all that stuff was going on. That was a, this is not World War III going on. So be careful with some of the thinking that we tend to absorb because it's, he's going to come when we don't expect it. When do we expect him to come? In World War II, right? That was a huge expectation, Jesus coming back in the great patriotic war. The world was coming apart. That was 70 years ago. And he didn't come. We would have expected him to. But Jesus has said again and again, I'm coming when you're not expecting. And that's not the time. It's wars and rumors of wars. That's stuff's going on all the time. Don't fix your thoughts on that. Keep your thoughts on me. <coughs> And on the signs I am giving to you, know that those things are going to be happening. But I want you not to be misled. I do not want you to live in fear. I do not want you to be confused by all this false teaching that's going on around. I be in intense suffering and persecution. There's quite a number of people in this room that that's a very real possibility. And you go back home. You're going to be in places where being a follower of Jesus is not okay. And you will be persecuted. And your families are persecuted. Um, you know, I can't say that I've ever experienced any intense persecution, but I, there's one time um, when I had a form of persecution. This might be something we'd experience more here in Mobile. So for, I was interviewing for a job. Uh, I got a degree in, in business finance in university. And so I was looking for a job in finance. And I interviewed with this very successful uh, financial planner. He helped people invest their money and stuff. And he was interviewing me to be his assistant. Many, I had numbers of interviews, and I got in a final interview, and what was the final interview? Get in the car, drive home with me, meet my wife, my children, see my house. Now, how close are we to getting a job at that point? Oh, that's close. That's a really good sign when they're taking you home to meet the family, right? So we're in the car driving towards the house. And he turns to me and he asks me a question. He said, Paul, what, what drives you? What motivates you? What gets you up out of bed every day? Or something like this. And, and I knew what he wanted to hear. Uh, I just want to be successful. I want to make a lot of money. I mean, this was the kind of guy he was. 
And there's nothing wrong with having a good job and being successful. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But in this situation, I knew what he wanted to hear, but I felt like I needed to say what the truth was. I said, you know what gets me out of bed every day? Jesus. Well, <laughs> you can imagine. I mean, if he was a believer, he could have said, hey, yeah, man, let's do it together, you know? And I would have had the job, right? So it's not about, it was just, I knew, I, I had to be honest with the man, that he knows what driving me, motivating me, is my relationship with Jesus. I never heard from him again. <laughs> it was over, just like that. And I knew the moment I said the word Jesus, that was it. You didn't want somebody you know, who was trying to follow Jesus working in the office. Just that, that was not where he was. And, and so I, I lost that opportunity. Um, but I, you know, it's like, okay, I, that's okay. Let him find the person that's more like him, but that's not who I am. Um, but that was a kind of like, okay, to follow Jesus, and I lost that opportunity as a result. But I'm Friends, I mean, people are suffering far greater things than that. But we, we know that even at work, uh, you know, that, that people are going to be mocking us because we're Christians, uh, making fun of us. And make, it makes it difficult to say, well, you know, uh, I'd like to pray about that, or I'd like to talk about that. There's that tension that we feel for standing up for and representing Jesus. We can get pushback. So whether it's, it's that, or it's just being arrested, thrown in prison, and being killed, and everything in between, this is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, and this is part of what the journey looks like between now and when Jesus comes back. And Jesus wants us to know that, so that we're not surprised along the way. So, the time between now and when Jesus returns are, are uncertain times. We do not know what's going to happen. But Jesus does <laughs> tell us what to expect. These are the kinds of things that can go on around us, and we just need to know that. And so he has given us some of the signs that we are not to be misled, and we are not to be afraid, and we are not to be confused, not to be surprised by suffering, and most certainly not to fall away when the going gets tough. But we will be persecuted, but the cool thing in the middle of all this, or through this, is the fact that some of the greatest movements of the Holy Spirit, and the outpouring, and the people coming into the kingdom are precisely in those times of suffering and persecution. You know what? I think I want to be part of that. I want to experience that. I want to see a great move of God. And I also need to be ready for this to happen, along with it. Are we ready? I want to finish uh, with this uh, passage from Peter who knew a few things about what we just talked about, right? He was on a cross, upside down for Jesus. That's how he went out, but he saw thousands, tens and thousands of people come to Christ also. So this is what he says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. So of course we're always surprised. <laughs> Don't be surprised. <laughs> Which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of the God rests on you. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. So if we are called to suffer and persecution, God of glory is upon us. His Spirit is with us. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's his promise.